Hello, I'm Dr. Lewis Myers, and this is Healthcare Today. We're going to talk today about a difficult subject, which is health violence in the healthcare setting, particularly violence directed toward healthcare workers. It seems that this is a growing problem, and it has led to the uh, involvement of emergency department and other physicians around the state and the involvement of our legislature. And we have two guests today who are going to tell us about what's been happening in recent years and particularly over the past year. Dr. Ben Smith is with us. He's the medical director of the emergency department at Central Vermont Medical Center. Dr. Smith is with us on Zoom today and he attended Columbia Medical School and then did his residency in emergency uh, medicine training at, out in Denver. Also with us by Zoom is Senator Brian Collimore, a Republican state senator from Rutland. Uh, senator Collimore has served for uh, 10 years now uh, in the state Senate and is involved in several committees. Uh, prior to joining the state Senate, he was the general manager of a number of radio stations in Rutland. He's going to talk to us about the legislative process and, and how uh, he brought this bill through the uh, legislature in the past year. So welcome to you both. I'd like to start with Dr. Smith, uh, who is on the front lines as both a medic, uh, physician treating patients in the emergency department as well as the administrator. Um, Dr. Smith, tell us a little bit about what's been going on out there and, and what, what has changed in recent years. Sure. Um, thanks, Dr. Myers. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, appreciate all the work that Senator Collimore and his colleagues did around this legislation in the past year. Um, I think as a starting point, I just wanted to mention something about the practice of emergency medicine, which is that the, the fact of the matter is for the emergency, part of emergency medicine has always entailed a little bit of the risk of violence. Um, and that's unfortunate, but it's always been part of the work that we do, uh, a sliver of risk there. People who come to the emergency department often come in extremes of uh, distress of one form or another, and that's that's the nature of the work. And so sometimes that uh, slips into violence, threats, or the risk of it. And that's always been a part of the work as long as I've been doing it, which is just over 20 years now between my residency in Denver and my work here in Vermont. So there's always been a component of that that we have accepted, um, you know, whether you were physicians, PAs, nurse practitioners, uh, nurses, uh, technicians, kind of all up and down the chain. It's 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 part. Um, a bit of this is a part of the work that we do, unfortunately, but it's something we accept and we learn how to manage and and deal with. I think what's happened over the last, for whatever set of societal, cultural sociopolitical reasons over the last five, six, seven years, um, really beginning even before COVID, but rapidly escalating in COVID is that the, the level of violence that um, our teams were dealing with, the level of threats of volatility um, dramatically escalated to the point that um, it has come repeatedly come close to jeopardizing the core mission we and core role we place we play in public safety, um, in the safety of our communities. Emergency medicine is challenging even on a normal day. We have entirely unpredictable patient flows. Sometimes we get 20 people who show up in the course of an hour, right? And they, any one of them could have a life-threatening illness. You throw in the middle of that um, one or two people who are um, violent for whatever set of reasons um, that might be. Uh, it becomes very challenging in, in, in any environment, and, and particularly sometimes in our under-resourced small rural hospitals, to manage those problems uh, to anyone's basic metric of safety. And we, we've just been seeing that um, with a great inc greatly increasing level over the last five years. And it's really continued uh, post-COVID when I think some of us thought it might abate a little bit. Can you tell so we, us perhaps a couple of clinical scenarios or think, situations that you recall uh, that have happened um, to, just to give the viewers some sense of what it's like f for you guys? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, it's hard to talk about because, you know, ER 
we're, we're a proud bunch, <laughs> you know, Absolutely. we don't like to appear vulnerable. Um, but you know, we've, any, you ask any, any of us, we have tons of stories. I can think of one of our nurses who was bringing, a. uh, uh, a drink to a, a patient who is in some significant distress and she dropped something on the ground, bent over to retrieve it. And the patient just hauled off and kicked her in the face, flipped her back over, knocked her out. This is probably a year and a half ago. Um, knocked her out cold. Um, she wakes up as her colleagues are dragging her away across the floor to get her out of harm's way. Um, she sustained a concussion was out for, I don't know, four or six weeks before she returned and, and has some, you know, some some trauma as as anyone would from that. Um, she's, you know, she's back at work. She's a fantastic nurse. Um, that's just one one event among many. I mean, we've had um, I mean, sure, Senator Call more is aware of the we all are probably about the Vermont Digger story about the nurse in Rutland who was uh, pregnant and punched in the stomach and had to be hospitalized. Um, I know of uh, at least two ER physicians in the state who are no longer practicing because of violence that occurred in the workplace. In one case, a pregnant woman who sustained an, an attack and another one who sustained a career ending traumatic brain injury being punched in the head. I mean, even in the last few weeks, we've had situations in our emergency department that have been um, uh, uh, really close to unmanageable uh, with multiple people injured in the same kind of e event. Um, when, so if this, I may, if I may, when a situation like this develops, and it sounds like it can develop very suddenly, uh, yeah. what is the response of the ER? And, and tell, tell us about what you have in the way of security. Uh, what is the first thing that happens? Obviously, other ER personnel will try and help, but what, what gets triggered there? Yeah, so we have policies in the hospital, um, you know, in our instance, it's called a code green. Um, there's different tiers of levels of behavioral response that we can call overhead uh, to get various levels of support. We have a great security team. Um, they, you know, off and on over the years have been understaffed and under-resourced, um, but the hospital's put in a lot of work in the last couple of years to help that, which has been, been great. Um, but the fact of the matter is our hospitals are under significant financial strain, as we all know, and, and, um, and, and, in, in, in addition to having a workforce crisis, which certainly extends to paying security guards 24-7 to be available to, to help us out in these circumstances. Um, but what happens is we will activate those resources and we'll get people that kind of swarm to the area. Um, but the reality is, you know, depending on what time of day these things happen, now, we may or may not have enough resources to safely deal with that situation, um, you know, depending on the staff who are on at any given time. And so uh, we have an array of options. So we uh, then, you know, carefully circumscribed um, and very highly regula regulated um, series of events, we can restrain people, we can apply uh, involuntary medications, um, if they are in the throes of, um, you know, a mental health crisis or something of that sort. Um, if they're not, and they're being violent, uh, th thanks to uh, this legislation that was passed, we can now have the police remove them. And that had been a bit of a challenge, uh, which is, I think, probably surprising to many viewers. But yeah, um, but why don't you explain what, mm -hmm. what was the, uh, what was the policy across the state before this recent legislation? Okay, um, and Senator Collimore, please jump in if I get this um, wrong. Um, there was a widespread, there was a widespread perception, uh, there was a widespread feeling amongst law enforcement that unless they had visualized uh, directly these incidents, um, that they uh, charges could not be filed. And I'm, I'm sure I'm probably not getting this quite precisely right, Senator, but. Um, uh, and what that meant that what we were experiencing fre frequently in the ED is we would have these violent episodes. By the time the, um, the law enforcement arrived, it would sort of have cooled down or resolved. And uh, the patient, may, you know, if they were in the, um, they would basically say, well, we're going to issue a citation. You have to appear in court in a few days and, and would leave. But that, that person would remain in the emergency department. Um, 
And so that was obviously very challenging for us to manage and, and often unsafe. And I, and I, I want to be really clear, uh, law enforcement is, is working under their own enormous stressors um, uh, from top to bottom these days. And we have great sympathy for um, the, uh, and, uh, and honor the work that they uh, do. And I think they're, they're in many of the same situations that we are as far as resource being strapped for resources and the ability to deal with these situations. So I, I don't, I want to be clear that I'm not blaming law enforcement for this. Um, but there was, they, I think, often felt that their hands were tied in their ability to help us. And so uh, the legislation that uh, the senator helped to enact um, gives them some more tools to help us and, and in certain cases remove people from healthcare settings uh, when the danger has become uh, too great. And that's we're gonna, been- We're going to uh, talk with Senator Collimore in just a moment, but let me go back. You, you mentioned the security and workforce challenges, et cetera. Obviously, we're having trouble even hiring police officers um, who are come in at a, you know, a higher salary than I'm sure than hospital security. What kind of training do hospital security get? Because they're the ones that are going to be putting hands on in, in many cases and helping restrain patients. Um, do you have any idea of what kind of training they get and where, where they're being hired from? Sure, yeah. Um, where they're being hired from, I don't, some of them are former law enforcement. Some of them, you know, um, there, there's a there's a wide variety of people who who are hired into that field. Um, they get very specific training that is tailored for the healthcare environment. The program that our hospital uses, which I think is fairly common around the state, is called Evade, and it combines. Um, it's I think run out of Dartmouth, although I, I probably shouldn't say that. I don't know the exact details of it. But it com combines um, training in the physical elements of, of necessary, unfortunately, occasionally necessary for restraint of, of, of volatile patients with, with extensive training in de-escalation, um, body language, all those kinds of things, trauma-informed care that, that we want our people to be bringing to those circumstances. So they, they have very extensive and prescribed training uh, for this before, they're, before they become active in the healthcare setting. Let me ask you this. Uh, you mentioned at, at the beginning in your introductory remarks that uh, this accelerated during COVID and, and then has continued. You know, we, we are hearing across the country in different industries, for example, airlines, where there seems to be an increase in unruly and violent passengers and other situations during COVID and after. Uh, do you think this, I mean, in your own opinion, do you think this is part of a trend that it's somehow the societal dysregulation has increased and we're just seeing some of that in the emergency department as well? Uh, that's Tough an question. enormous question. I, yeah. I think the short answer is yes. Um, yeah, I, I, that would be a whole nother conversation we could spend a ton of time on. Um, but I do think we there is something there is something about our culture in the last couple of decades i think that has resulted in this but i you know i think the other thing that that has to be said and this was a difficult part of the conversation last year in the legislature and sort of remains an open question um but th there is a general increase in the volatility of in and sort of incivility in our society and the er is ground zero for that 100 mm -hmm. but with these violent episodes um and this is this is very hard to talk about uh, dr myers but but there is an overlap with our str patients struggling with mental health and substance abuse and it's very hard for us in the state, I think, in particular to talk about because we have very um, uh, uh, open and free and, and, and um, uh, generous approach to patients who are struggling with these issues as we should and, 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 a, and a deep concern about stigma. And that is all in very, very appropriate. Um, but I think we, we, as a state need to carefully, um, cautiously figure out how to talk about that tiny sliver of, of, of patients who are struggling with some very severe mental illness or very severe substance abuse problems, um, who do have 
violence as a part of their illness. It's a tiny subset, but it is a, it is a very real thing. And we seemed as a state to have a, a, a lot of difficulty talking about that forthrightly. And I think it comes from a good place because we don't want to stigmatize. And, 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 and that makes a ton of sense. But I think um, we've made a lot of progress with the bill last year. Um, but I think we still have a little of ways to go um, as well, we that, do. That so is, many, that is right? thoughtful. And, yeah. and uh, we're going to come back to that. I want you to stay with us. I'm going to turn to Senator Cullimore now. Um, Senator Cullimore, when did you start to hear about this problem? When did it sort of come onto your radar? I know there are so many other issues you deal with in the state Senate, but how, how did this come into your attention? Well, thank you very much again, Dr. Myers, for having me here. And I want to just begin by uh, telling Dr. Smith how appreciative I am of his uh, position on all of this and how grateful everyone should be about the work that goes on each and every day in our emergency rooms across the state. Um, they're a very special breed of people who work there. I was approached by a lobbyist from the Hospital Association at a legislative breakfast, I believe it was last fall, at the Rutland Regional Medical Center. Uh, and then when the legislature reconvened, I did speak with Senator Sears, he's chair of the Judiciary Committee, and Senator Lyons, who's the chair of Health and Welfare in the Senate. So they together put a bill uh, forth and I can explain the process of how that happens in just a second, but the bill had a, a number on it, S-36, and it became Act 24 once the governor signed it into law. And again, we can go over some of the provisions of the bill, but Dr. Smith was correct when he said this was a non-witnessed misdemeanor offense. And so often in the emergency rooms, as he correctly pointed out, what happens a lot of times when patients who are suffering from severe mental crisis interact with the workers there, uh, it does have a tendency to get heightened in terms of verbal abuse, but also physical abuse. So we tried to fashion something that would deal with both of those. And as he also correctly mentioned, I think that we're gonna have to take another look at it once we reconvene again uh, in January. So how does a bill happen? There are 150 House members and 30 senators. Any one of those 180 people can ask to be uh, on a bill that's drafted by the legislative uh, council. Uh, we have a group of lawyers that work in essence for the legislature. They put a bill together, it's put on the floor, and then the lieutenant governor and the secretary of the Senate, in our case, uh, decide what committee it will be referred to. In this case, S-36 was referred to the Judiciary Committee, which is comprised of five people. They took testimony on it and finally took a vote on it and brought it for the forth to the floor where it was voted on. And then that bill goes across to the other body, the House, and they do the same thing. It's referred to their uh, like committee and testimony taken and it goes to the floor. And if both uh, houses pass it, then it goes on to the governor who signs it or doesn't if he chooses to veto it. And it becomes law usually by July 1st of that year. So that's what happened here. And I don't know whether you need any more explanation Can you tell about us, how a yeah, bill sure. tell gets us referred. A, I'm sorry, tell us specifically then what S-36 or Act 24 stipulates. Yeah, it, it's an eight page act. So I can't get into, well, I could, but we'll probably be here <laughs> uh, a short enough time that I won't be able to. But in essence, it adds a category of health care worker in a hospital and then a person providing emergency medical treatment. Those are the two categories that were added to existing language in Title 13, which has to do with crimes and criminal procedures. So it uh, allows an officer who has probable cause to believe a person has committed or is committing a misdemeanor outside the presence of that officer to either issue a citation or arrest that person and in the instance of the hospital remove that person uh, from the emergency room it does add two other provisions to it criminal threatening and disorderly conduct for engaging in fighting or in violent tumultuous or threatening behavior so it doesn't have to be a physical assault it could be encapsulated with someone threatening someone 
or in, in essence, uh, engaging in disorderly conduct. And what happens is they, uh, if they violate that, they could be arrested and imprisoned for not more than two years or fined not more than $2,000 or both. So how does it work in a hospital or other like a convenient medical facility when the law enforcement officer is not present at the time that this happens? Well, when they are uh, responding to a crime committed by a patient, an authorized representative of the hospital will disclose to the law enforcement officer the following information before the officer can remove the patient from the hospital. The, the information, it's sufficient to, to uh, confirm whether the patient is stabilized, has been evaluated, or is awaiting inpatient care, and then any other information that will be necessary for the purposes of safely taking custody of the patient. And the law enforcement officer, by the way, cannot do that unless the um, administrator or who's ever acting as the, as the authorized representative of the medical facility uh, says that they have in fact been stabilized. And so that's how that works. And we will have two studies done, one by the Vermont Program for Quality and Healthcare and one by the Department of Public Safety that will go over all the data that's been collected by uh, those two entities to see whether this is working well or whether we need to make further refinements to the statute. So these are misdemeanors, they're classified as misdemeanors, not felonies, so even grievous bodily harm would still come under misdemeanor? Well, again, um, that would depend on uh, the citation that was issued. It could be both, yeah. if, uh, if, or one or the other. If there's a serious injury, that could be a felony. Okay. So just to go back, uh, Dr. Smith was talking in more general terms after I asked the question about society and, and, and are, have we seen a change in recent years in terms of dysregulation. What are your thoughts on that? You've been in the Senate for 10 years and you've been, been in the community for even longer, obviously. I don't think there's any question about that. And I sympathize with, again with the, the folks that work in the emergency rooms across the state. They have a very tough job. So does our law enforcement community. Uh, I think there has been an increased and marked uh, instance of, of uh, disruptive behavior. You mentioned the airline industry, which is also going through problems with that. I also happen to be an ice hockey official. And so um, what used to be sort of okay behavior with people yelling and screaming about a particular call you made, sometimes now rises to the level of people waiting at the gate or waiting in the parking lot after, yeah. after a game to have a further discussion with you. So I don't think there's any doubt, and I don't know what the, what the causes are. We've certainly had an increase in, uh, in mental health uh, interventions. Uh, I don't know that we're doing enough yet to, uh, to uh, help people. And I do think we need to strike a balance. I think Dr. Smith's correct there. We don't need to stigmatize people uh, any further than, than we need to. But at the same time, we need to make sure that people are protected, especially in the healthcare uh, instances. You know, we're talking with about emergency uh, departments, but there are other areas in the hospital which are even uh, grayer area. I know that, for example, on our medicine floors at my hospital, we have a number of patients with dementia who, when they get very confused and scared and agitated, they will hit nurses. Um, it's hard some, to hold them responsible because they truly are demented, and often they don't really understand or know what they're doing. Uh, so that's a difficult situation. Um, the other difficult situation, I think, is in psychiatric wards, and I know um, we have a large one at Rutland, and, and uh, Central Vermont has the facility in Berlin there, uh, where people have been committed or are there for psychiatric disorders, and um, it's often that's a very dangerous place to work for staff, um, and it's hard to piece out how much uh, uh, people actually can be held responsible under those situations. Dr. Smith, what are your thoughts on that? You know, just some of these other areas in the hospital where it's even a grayer area, perhaps, than, than an emergency department, whether it be demented patients or psychiatric patients upstairs in the, on the psych ward uh, who, who strike out and injure people. Yeah, I, so a lot of thoughts on this, although I don't practice in those settings myself. You know, we have a small community hospital like you do in Rutland, and, and so we all know each other. So, I, 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 you know, I'm intimately familiar with these kinds of stories. I think one thing that we just have to uh, talk about with the with the geriatric um, dementia 
uh, challenge is that there are very few resources in our state uh, for these uh, folks to go and be cared for uh, outside of an inpatient hospital floor. Um, and many nursing homes who are, as we know, are, are very strapped for resources will refuse to take um, dementia patients who have behavioral problems. And so many of our hospitals are, are frankly overwhelmed with patients uh, of this sort who have absolutely nowhere to go. Um, and it is uh, on the verge of breaking our inpatient capacity. Um, and so that is a critical need uh, for our state to get ahead of um, because we have, you know, we have what we're like the uh, fourth oldest state in the country or something. And if you take Chittenden County, second out, oldest, I think. Number two. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, and that's not going away anytime soon. So we have a, we have a, a, a tidal wave of, of, um, uh, elderly patients uh, that are going to be coming our way over the next decade, um, and we do not have the resources to meet that 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 need in any way. Um, so that's that's one separate issue. I think your question about about holding uh, people in that circumstance responsible. I mean, if none of us, you know, we we reckon, we 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 deal with folks who have dementia or are in the throes of a, of a, a terrifying psychosis all the time it it is a is a it is a terrible thing to struggle with um and and we take our role in that extraordinarily seriously i don't think any of us would believe that someone in those circumstances should be punished in in, in any kind of uh, contempt you know, contemporary way but what we do need is the resources and the 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 ability to keep ourselves safe uh, while we're caring for those patients um and we are still limited in that and I, I think, you know, one thing um, I worry that, you know, as a public, we're a little bit still stuck in this notion of, um, you know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, you know, 50 years ago of the, the sort of barbarity of mental health treatment, you know, um, 50, uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And we still have this mental picture that that's the way things are um, in inpatient units. But it's just not the case. I mean, there are very professional, diligent, compassionate people doing this work. Um, it is highly regulated as it should be. Um, and anytime behavioral restraints are used, it is scrutinized with a fine toothed comb. Every single incident is reviewed in our hospital. Um, and, uh, and it's scrutinized by the Centers for Medicaid Services and the Department of Mental Health. And, and it, it, like this is incredibly, um, uh, visible and regulated area. But so, in, so we're a long way from all those terrible things that happened so many years ago. Um, but we've drifted to a point where we often just don't have, particularly in the state of Vermont, the regulatory tools to safely manage these patients. So I don't think with those patients that are in the throes of a terrible mental illness, um, a critical mental illness, I guess I'd say, or um, dementia, uh, None of us want to see those. I mean, that would be crazy, right? None of us want to see those patients put in jail, or God forbid, or anything like that. But we need the care resources to manage those patients ethically. Um, and we're a long way from that in this state. Well, I want to thank both of you for being here. And I, th this is an interesting, uh, perhaps Senator Collimore is, uh, is able to hear this. And maybe that'll be a next thing we'll look at, establishing a some increased resources, particularly for our geriatric uh, population who is struggling. Uh, but both of you have, have really contributed to moving this issue forward. Uh, I'm glad that there'll be some in, uh, data collection as we go forward in the next year or two to see if the act is actually, the law is actually uh, working in the way it was meant to. But I think it's an important step forward and I think we can all be uh, uh, appreciative of that. Thank you both. Senator Brian Collimore from Rutland, Senator uh, Dr. Ben Smith uh, from Central Vermont Medical Center. Thank you, and please join us on our next episode of Healthcare Today. <laughs>